So in the new issue of Permaculture magazine, we look at the issue of pasture-fed beef, animals in the landscape, and the whole discussion about plant-based diets. Welcome to our micro herd, Stottish and Longhorns. We have seven individual cattle, including three cows and their followers. Sallow, Snowy, Poppy, Quartz, Ted, Umby and Uno. We do a very small scale beef production for our own consumption and a few friends. And this is done um, in a very traditional way. The animals are pasture fed. They're not fed any grain or any soya or palm kernel. And they take about two, between two to three years to raise the beef compared to the sort of 15 to 20 months that commercial beef production takes. So this is Ted eating some wheat straw. They really like a bit of the wheat straw and again that's local, it's come from a farm just down the road. So we're trying to make this cattle model as sustainable as is possible. There are obviously lots of issues at the moment about plant-based diets and whether we can justify keeping animals in the landscape but um, much of the countryside that we know and have grown up with for generations is based on the fact that animals have to graze the fields. So. These are English Longhorns, which is a very traditional breed. It was quite a rare breed about 60 odd years ago, but uh, it's made something of a resurgence. And there's about 14,000 of them now in the country, largely as a result of enthusiasts keeping the breed going. But they are a very hardy breed. They wouldn't look out of place in a, in a sort of medieval landscape. So very, very traditional old English breed. Okay, so this is the who's who of our micro herd. So. This is Poppy, she's the matriarch of the herd, so she's about 10 or 11 years old now and she's definitely the head cow. She's very, very laid back, nothing really phases Poppy. And then next to her we've got Sallow, who was Poppy's son from two years ago. He's a very, uh, a very calm, laid back sort of chap. And then along here we've got Snowy, and Snowy is the first calf that we ever had born. She was born in the middle of the beast from the east winter, um, and she's now in calf herself. Uh, so she'll be calving in April. So that's Snowy. So despite their slightly scary looks, Longhorns are actually very docile breed, um, which is probably their salvation really, because if they weren't uh, if they weren't easy going, they could be quite a problem with a set of headgear like that. But uh, although they look scary, they are actually very, very docile and easy to handle. So uh, it certainly uh, makes keeping them a lot easier. So this is the youngsters. These are last summer's calves, Uno and Umbi. They're uh, eating their hay. So... And swinging around here, we've got Quartz, who's one of the cows. And behind her is her calf of last year. It's called Ted. <coughs> so they're eating this hay. The hay's all local. It comes from about three miles away. Um, and whilst ideally they would stay out all the year round, on the heavy Shropshire clay here, they just make such a mess in the winter and would absolutely destroy the ground. So. They do have to spend uh, a few weeks of the winter in this uh, nice airy shed. A garden that is alive with wildlife is literally alive. Um, a garden that is so meticulously controlled with every weed removed, um, treated like an outside space, is massively vulnerable and open to the elements. And that is not a climate change savvy garden. A climate change savvy garden is massively low maintenance ultimately. All you're doing is allowing nature in to lend a helping hand to the benefit of your growing efforts to provide natural resilience. Nature itself holds an awful lot of the answers. So by allowing the natural world in, by not so meticulously controlling our outside space, by looking, by connecting, we're gonna feel incredibly good in ourselves, as well as providing greater resilience overall for our veg patches and growing efforts. Mixed planting, 
Mixed planting is, again, there's nothing new about this. It's also called um, polyculture. Um, and it's just really a way of creating a natural biodiversity. Because in an organic gardening system, crop rotation is a way of protecting soil. So you're not growing the same crops year after year and depleting the soil of certain nutrients and you don't get pest buildup. But what I discovered purely through chance and experimentation is that if you have different crops from the same family sufficiently distanced apart so if you have um, say five tomato plants you want to have at least five foot between each of those plants and then you have plants from different families planted equally separately apart you use salad leaves and herbs as fillers in between you're creating a multi-layered um, biodiversity effectively that enables you to not have to think about very exacting crop rotation plans. I don't know about you but for years with um, with the veg patch with the polytunnels I used to draw these very exacting plans of what went where and when and what had to follow it and it used to make my head whirl having to be so exacting about it all. But in this more free spirited system which is much more akin to the, the peasant gardeners of, of old you don't have to think about that at all. You can mix plant, you can allow things to self-seed and there's much more freedom therein and it's lower maintenance for the gardener. The reason it's, um, it's also low maintenance is that it's much harder for pest or disease to move in. So say for example with um, one of the, well actually one of the main reasons why I first came about this idea, I say well, though it's not a new idea, it's what people used to do, I was, um, I was growing tomato plants and I had an issue with blight in the polytunnels where the blight, which is airborne, fungus, moved from plant to plant to plant. And it occurred to me that it was because the plants were so close together that it was so easy for the, the spores to move so fast between the plants. So now with the, the system that I employ, it's, it's not an issue whatsoever and I've done trials of growing um, block planted potatoes mixed with potatoes that are mixed in with other produce and it's really quite striking um, it's quite striking difference that you know I just don't get blight on the other potatoes that are mixed planted. With regards to pest and disease um, that it's also the fact that if you think about things like mildew if you think about say if you had a, a big block of carrots big block of very impressive, um, you know, it's probably row planted carrots, which is what you're supposed to do. This idea, if you go to any veg patch around the country, that everyone's block planting everything. But actually, with, say, the carrots, you might as well put a sign up saying, carrot fly come this way, because it's the smell of the leaves that help to attract the, um, the carrot fly. They can smell it from, it, it's more than a mile away. But actually, if you look at the idea of mixed planting, like you get in companion planting, where, with, for example, with, um, with carrots, you're supposed to mix in onions or marigolds or, you know, to have this mixture of different plants together. It's a bit like that, just on a much bigger, more free-spirited way. And if plants are, are separated, it's much harder for whichever creature it is that wants to nibble on said plant to actually find what they're looking for. So it's much better in terms of pest control. The use of the word pest is actually a bit controversial though because in a biodiverse mixed planted working with nature garden, the idea of one particular creature getting out of control is more of a sign in permaculture sort of circles that actually what you need is something to, to eat said pest it's a sign that things are out of balance. So everything actually has its place. A slug is food for various different creatures. It's food for certain spiders will eat slugs, for, for lizards, for frogs. Um, the idea is that what you need to do is actually try and encourage as much wildlife as you can in. So it's an eat and be eaten world where things are kept in check.
Macdonald, one of the directors of the social enterprise farm Woodside up on the Isle of Arran. I've been asked for by Permaculture magazine to give a little bit of introduction to who we are and what we're doing up here. We are a community farm. I had hoped to take you outside, but as you can see, it's still raining. Beautiful West Coast Scottish January weather, it's still raining horrible here so today rather than showing us showing you our vegetable garden and everything we've been doing and um, growing vegetables for our community during the covid pandemic i thought i'd show you our 400 eggs being packaged up and sent out a polytunnel just now, not our normal system, we're very free range normally. Oh, this girl's trying to be free range here but she's not allowed to be because of bird flu. So at the back there, that's our Ridgedale style mobile chicken tractor, which our layers normally have 13 acres of delicious gorgeous pasture that they get rotated on. But due to the bird flu restrictions, we've given them this extra space of a polytunnel and this is where they're hanging out at the moment, trying to escape for a bid to freedom, bless them. So that's over 400 eggs ready to go to our local high school for the key workers, kids, care home and some of our local shops. So when we're not doing eggs in a miserable Scottish day, what we're trying to do here is grow as much local produce for our community as possible. Um, COVID highlighted the issues to so many communities that food really has to be grown in the locality as much as possible. You might not be getting ban bananas and mangoes here on the west coast of Scotland, but certainly lots of greens, lots of salads, lots of great vegetables to keep people going all year round. We took an unused piece of pasture um, that hadn't been used for anything other than grazing for a long time and set it up as 40, 10 metre, uh, sorry, 30 metre long by 75 centimetre growing beds um, set up in a no dig style. We did remove the top layer of grass just because we started this project at the end of April, beginning of May, and we wanted to get going as quickly as we could. And as you can see from some of the photos, we managed to produce over 1.3 tonnes of food, which we distributed um, either free of charge or donation, or some people even paid forward for other members of our community. And um, yeah, managed to help provide for our community, provide some seasonal jobs, and looked at the challenges people were facing in regards to COVID just in a slightly different way. you a little rundown of our day-to-day -day, packaging eggs looking after chickens homeschooling two children <laughs> who I think came in earlier on and um, a little bit of an overview of our COVID project up here on Aran. There's lots of other things going on at Woodside Aran. We've got a really exciting 2021 season ahead, more growing, different ways of distributing food in our community, our first tiny home project, which we hope to have finished and rented out. Um, so if you want to come and visit us later on in the summer. And yes, lots of other um, homesteading type activities. We keep meat chickens, we have pigs, hoping to get some um, cattle this year. So if you're interested in finding out more about what we do here, um, how we integrate permaculture design into a, a larger size setup, um, our uh, farm is 80 acres and also regenerative agriculture techniques and lots of other things. If you want to keep up with what we're doing this season and later on, um, please follow us on social media. We've got our own YouTube channel, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. So that's just a little bit about what we're doing here on this very grey and rainy January day on the Isle of Arran. If you're interested in finding out some more detail about how we set up the permaculture designed market garden 
this summer, then please check out the spring edition of Permaculture Magazine, where we'll give a lot more details, tell you some of the mistakes we made, some of the successes we had, and maybe it'll inspire you to get growing in your community. Thanks very much.